Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to this presentation about Automobilista Motorsports Simulator. Um, we'll start by introducing ourselves. Um, okay, my name is Tran. I'm a software engineer at uh, Luminous. And my name is Marcel Offermans. I'm actually a fellow at Luminous and also director at Luminous uh, Technologies and a big sim racing fan. Um, let's start with a quote. What is so important about driving faster than anyone else? A lot of people go through life doing things badly. Racing is important to men who do it well. When you're racing, it's, it's life. Anything that happens before or after, it's just waiting. Okay, that sort of gives you my opinion on the importance of racing and also uh, sim racing. And uh, with that, uh, let's start by going over the agenda for this uh, talk. Um, I'm actually going to start out with a short introduction about the history of sim racing from the very first sort of computer-like uh, racing simulation or rather game, all the way up to the current uh, state of technologies. Uh, then we'll do a short introduction of Risa Studios, the company that we collaborated with in uh, making the Automobilista uh, simulator. Uh, next up is a short overview of well, how to build a racing uh, simulator, sort of going over the architecture of it, what are the important building blocks, uh, what's important when uh, doing this design. Uh, then we'll actually introduce Automobilista, uh, talk a little bit about uh, some of the stuff uh, that was already there, some of the stuff that we did uh, to enhance the simulator. Uh, and finally, we're going to wrap up with uh, some lessons learned during this, uh, this project and looking ahead at the future of the simulator a little bit. Yeah. So, let's get uh, started. Let's turn down the volume completely. So, this is one of the first uh, sort of racing games. Uh, it's not really a simulator, but it was the first uh, thing that actually featured a steering wheel, uh, some pedals, and a car you could sort of uh, control. It was called Speed Race. It's also one of the first uh, computer games at all, uh, created in 1974. And well, at that time, it was a lot of fun for people. Right now, we're looking at this and going, uh, even my mobile phone can do a lot better than this, but this is where it all got started. Next up, uh, pole position, uh, one of the classics in the arcade. Uh, it featured sort of semi-3D graphics. Uh, you had two gears actually, and you could steer the car. And uh, yeah, it was kind of tricky uh, avoiding all the cars. Uh, still not really a simulation, I mean, uh, physics-wise it was a very simple model, uh, but uh, a lot of fun and it's one of the first things that I actually tried out myself as a little kid playing in the arcade uh, up to the point where my parents bought me a personal computer to get me home more often, so uh, some great memories of that. The first sort of real uh, simulator came two years later for the BBC and Commodore 64, a game called Revs. It featured one single car, one single track, uh, Silverstone actually. It's kind of hard to recognize. It has a 3D-ish uh, image, so it sort of looks realistic. Uh, still not great by today's standards. And it was actually insanely difficult to, to drive at the time. You were still steering it with your keyboard, or if you were lucky, some kind of joystick, but it was a digital joystick, so you kept hitting the buttons, etc., trying to steer it, glide it through some corners. Uh, at the time, I was very frustrated because it took me a long time to even complete a single lap uh, in, this, uh, in this game. Uh, but it's probably the first game which has somewhat realistic physics. Also, you look at stuff like frame rate, it's really awful. Uh, you have a lot of lag uh, because of that, but uh, uh, it was a lot of fun at the time. And the author of this game then uh, proceeded with uh, the next one. And uh, I 
have to turn the volume down completely here because it makes a lot of noise. This is Formula One Grand Prix. And this has full 3D graphics. There were a few tricks they did to create round tires because that would have taken way too many polygons. So that, those are sprites, but all the rest of it is really a 3D model. Uh, you had a complete gearbox, you could set up your car, uh, and if you had a really fast computer, it would generate frame rates that were even a bit better than this one. Uh, this is 1992, it's on the first Amiga computer. Uh, it was later ported to PCs as well. And, uh, well, this is actually one of the games I had a lot of fun uh, doing. Uh, there were lots of competitions going on, but all of those offline, because there was really no network. You couldn't even connect two computers at the time. So when we competed, we all drove our races independently, submitted the final race times, and that gave us an idea of who had won uh, the game. Uh, so that's really sort of the, the, the last of the offline uh, games. Uh, fast forward a couple of years later, slide and excuse me for the loud audio is Grand Prix Legends and this is a classic because it was actually the first uh, game where people could compete online. Uh, it was sort of the start of the internet as well around that time. Uh, people were connected mostly through modems still. Uh, some had cable already. Uh, but this was a game where you had a server you could actually join with up to 20 people and have online races uh, compete against each other. And that really uh, changed uh, a lot in racing because it is fun driving against AI, but it's always more fun when you can beat real persons and brag about it afterwards. Uh, again, this was a simulator that was, at the time, very difficult to drive. I mean, they simulated the 1967 Formula One era. Uh, that was a time when, well, they were still racing on non-slick tires that lasted the whole season. So they didn't really have much grip. Cars didn't have any wings or other uh, ground effects. So again, they had no grip and had to start braking even before they could see the corner coming. So that was quite, quite difficult to, uh, to work with. Uh, but once you uh, mastered it, uh, it was a lot of fun competing. Uh, and uh, this sort of sparked an all uh, big online uh, racing community. <laughs> we get fast forward uh, to 2005, which is the release of the first version of R Factor. And R Factor was again an important step in development uh, because it featured uh, a simulation that was easily modded by just about anybody in the community. Uh, it was so open that you could actually create your own cars, create your own tracks. Uh, so after the base game was released and uh, actually came with a, a few tracks, a few cars, in the years after that, a community started building other tracks, building cars, uh, and, and that sparked again a whole community. And I think by now there are hundreds of tracks and cars available for this game which is great uh, value for money if you buy the game for like 40 euros and then can download all that content uh, basically for free. It's also a creative way to sort of circumvent all kinds of licensing restrictions that you would otherwise have if you would actually have to license all this content for a game. Uh, so it's a creative way of, of solving that problem as well. So that's, I think, the history. Uh, let's fast forward to the here and now. Um, and if we look at sim racing in the, the current I age and time, uh, there are basically three important engines that uh, are worth mentioning. The first engine is iRacing, and this has been developed from the Grand Prix Legends simulation and a few titles before that, all the way to uh, the current uh, uh, system. iRacing is an online uh, only racing game. You actually have to buy a subscription to it buy the cars you want and the tracks you want. It provides really realistic 3D models and uh, there's a, an extensive online competition uh, for you uh, that actually uh, has many different rankings and there's a few real world drivers uh, joining that as well. Uh, so it's really good way uh, to test your skill, 
There's a ranking system in it that always pitches you against people that are sort of as good or bad as yourself. So you're always in a race where you have something to race for, uh, which is uh, really good. Um, but it's not moddable. So that's, that's the downside. The, the content that comes with it is very high quality. It's not the cheapest either. You probably spend about 100 euros a year on subscriptions and stuff like that. You can gain some money back. If you drive a lot, you get free credits. So that's a good way of making sure that people play your game. It makes it cheaper. Um, uh, but this is one of the three engines. The second one is a game called uh, Assetto Corsa. It has the newest graphics engine of them all. So from graphics point of view, this is one of the nicest simulations you can see. Uh, it actually came from a game called Netcar Pro. Uh, after that, they did a game for Ferrari called the Ferrari Academy. And there's been a few uh, titles in between, uh, but this is their latest uh, title. Uh, at the moment, only available for the PC, uh, but they're currently doing a port to the consoles as well, taking on the big boys there, Forza and Gran Turismo. So it will be interesting to see how that, uh, how that goes. And uh, the third and final oh. one oops, sorry, is uh, a game, uh, an engine called... Uh, uh, R-Factor, uh, the current title is R-Factor 2, uh, which is already a few years old. Uh, it builds on the first R-Factor title, so it's basically still a very open uh, model. Graphics are a bit nicer, there's a lot more uh, going on in the physics department. Uh, they have realistic weather, uh, you can have rainfall, you can even link that to real weather and stuff like that. Uh, and again, there's a big community behind it, building all kinds of different cars and tracks. Uh, another thing that's worth mentioning is that uh, a lot of titles have actually uh, taken uh, the R-Factor engine, uh, licensed it, and built other racing simulators on top of that. And that's a nice bridge to the project that we've been working on, uh, which also did that. Yeah. So we. We cooperated with uh, a studio called uh, Ryza Studios, which uh, started as a modding group. They released a mod for uh, R-Factor, which contains old uh, Formula One cars. And uh, fast forwarding in time, they also released some uh, standalone titles after the modding. Um, some worth mentioning uh, titles were uh, stock car, and the variants of that were Formula trucks. So. How did we get involved? Um, Riser Studios uh, obtained uh, a source license for the Isaiah engine, but they were still looking for some software developers, uh, which they contacted us to work on the game. Uh, the team is working across the entire world. We got uh, some members working in Brazil, and Croatia, and Spain. So, on to the anatomy of a racing simulator, or as we software people like to call it, architecture of a racing simulator. Uh, let's start with uh, how to write a, a simple game. Basically, every game starts with a, a generic game loop, like you can see on the left, uh, which is basically just a while loop while not game over. You uh, keep continuing. And then there's a couple of steps you take in succession and you repeat that. It's basically first reading some kind of inputs from keyboard or joystick or whatever. Uh, then based on that input, you move all the objects in the world a little bit. Uh, and then you render uh, the graphics, uh, generate some sound and repeat that until the game somehow ends. And if you compare that to a racing simulator, it's, it's very similar. So while the race is not over, we're actually also reading inputs. Uh, then we're calculating the, the physics, uh, which in, in turn makes objects move a little bit. Uh, if there's AI cars involved, artificial intelligence, uh, we also do those calculations and try to figure out where this AI car should be going. And once we're done with that, uh, with a few extra steps, we generate some force feedback uh, to your steering wheel. Uh, then render graphics, uh, play sounds, and uh, another thing we do that's kind of special is do networking 
and also recording a replay so you can later watch uh, your race uh, in some kind of replay tool. So that, that's the basics of the, the simulator loop. And uh, let's go into each of these steps in turn uh, and, and start with, with inputs. So for racing, an input is usually some kind of uh, steering wheel uh, that's attached. Uh, nowadays, it's always uh, linked through, through some USB cable. Uh, usually also have two or three pedals. Uh, if you have a luxury uh, wheel, you have three. You have a clutch, otherwise you have to do with a button for the clutch or something like that. Uh, you might have an H pattern shifter or a sequential shifter. And uh, some simulators also have some button boxes for, for other features. But that's basically the inputs that, that you need. And as with anything in this, uh, this sim, it's important uh, that we actually uh, read these things very often to have low latency, because low latency is one of the most important design constraints to have in such a simulator, because uh, that in the end determines how realistic the experience will be. The more latency you have, the more problems you'll have catching the car, driving on the limit. So with everything we do, we try to keep the latency as short as possible, which means reading the inputs at a fairly high frequency. That's a nice bridge to physics. Um, physics are probably the most difficult thing to get right uh, in, in a racing game. Um, we actually drive the physics loop at about 400 hertz. Uh, this is way higher than you'll ever be able to display on your monitor. So you could argue why do it that often if you can't even see uh, 400 updates per second. Uh, that's for two reasons. Uh, one I just mentioned, uh, reducing latency. And uh, the other is actually uh, to make sure that the algorithms that we use are stable because uh, it's some uh, rigid body uh, physics that we're using where we have all kinds of masses that are connected through constraints. Uh, that gives us some big matrices and we need to solve those and uh, the algorithms for solving those work best if you have small time steps, then they're the most uh, stable. Um, if you then look at what actually uh, should I be simulating, then probably the tire model, which is the, the only contact between uh, the car and the road and the rest of the world is the most important thing uh, to get right. Actually, how much friction you have on the contact surface, what the contact surface looks like for every tire, uh, what the pressure of the tire is, how it deforms on the load. Uh, those are really tricky things to get right and that's probably the most important aspect of the physics model for uh, such racing simulations. And it's also difficult because it's hard to get data on that stuff. Even Formula One teams don't get data from the tire manufacturers about exactly how the tire performs. They have to do their own tests, do their own measurements and go with that. So that's the only way to, to create a model through data that you collect. And that's also the problem that we have when simulating such cars. So that's a good question. How do you actually get that uh, data from the real world? Um, best way to do it is to have contacts with some of the racing teams because even uh, in the slower classes, uh, they do a lot of data collection themselves. So they usually end up with lots of telemetry data. And it's that data that we often uh, use to see if we're uh, doing the right thing. Um, we're actually using the same tools as they are to collect and compare the data. So we can load the real world data into the same tools and compare lap times and look at all the graphs and see if it's, if it's right. If we're not that lucky, another good way of doing this is looking at videos, in-car videos, just looking at the speed, where they brake, what the lap times are how much the car rolls, which is harder to see in a video, but if you get lucky, you have some outside video as well. And, and that's, that's quite an important tool. And funnily enough, a lot of racing drivers nowadays, when they go to each track, they have a video first person view on their laptop of some fast laps of the circuit. And they just watch that in the hotel room all night long until they memorized it completely. So those are the ways in which we can 
sort of get the cars close, but the more data we have, the better it becomes, obviously. So next up is uh, force feedback. Um, first uh, thing to mention is why is that even important to have force feedback? It sounds cool to have it, but it's actually crucial because uh, in a simulator, we're already missing lots of feedback that a real-world driver has. All the g-forces that uh, happen on the car and on the driver, you don't have those in the simulator. So all you have is what you see on the road, what you hear sound-wise, and what you can feel in your steering wheel. And in the steering wheel, what's actually important is that when you're right on the limit of grip in a corner, you can sort of feel the steering get lighter and lighter and lighter, and then suddenly you lose grip. So if you can really feel that, you can get really close to the limit. So it's important again to have that low latency and to have really good feeling in your wheel. And if that's good, then you can almost close your eyes and drive the corner just on that feeling. So it's, it's important feedback and uh, it's good, good to have. If you look at the, the simulator uh, outside, um, you can also have a try and you will feel how good that feedback is. You feel every bump on the road. If you hit the curb, you get some massive uh, feedback on that. Uh, that one uses an industrial motor, so it's really precise and really strong. If you uh, go to a media market and you buy a somewhat cheaper wheel, somewhat more affordable one, you still get fairly good feedback, but there's always some kind of chain or belt in between uh, because they just can't afford a big industrial motor in that one. So uh, that's an important aspect and important to get right. Then there's artificial intelligence, uh, which is tricky for a lot of reasons. First of all, I'm not sure if we're ever going to be able to create something that's artificially intelligent. But then again, racing is not that complex to do well. You just have to go fast. It uh, becomes a little bit more difficult because uh, you don't want these robots to just drive into you. They have to take you into account. But then again, they should not go out of their way for you either. And so they should race you. Uh, not uh, be too aggressive, but also uh, provide a, a decent fight. So that's, that's one uh, thing that's hard to get right. The other is that if you're simulating uh, the physics of a car, uh, that takes a lot of computing power. If you need to simulate 30 artificial intelligence cars as well, well, you easily end up with a full network if they were using exactly the same physics calculations. So you can't do that. You have to make something that's a little bit simpler, but still very close. So you're never racing the exact same cars. That's also a downside of uh, racing them. Uh, so best solution is just race other people online. Uh, but still, there's other reasons to even have AI. Uh, one of them is to actually implement driving aids. You can have some stability control, steering help, and basically, they, they are using the same algorithms that an AI uh, would, would use. And the other is network prediction. And uh, Tran will get into that in, in a little bit. But uh, we use AI in that as well. Okay. So networking. Um, yeah, if you want to play with your friends, you will have to in some way communicate with your friends. And we do it uh, with uh, client server based networking. Uh, it's based on uh, some events, which are also uh, prioritized. can imagine that uh, when you have an event that uh, plays some uh, wind noises, that uh, won't get any priority against uh, an event that wants to restart a race. So uh, the events that are uh, prioritized uh, because of that reason. Um, latency, as um, Marcel mentioned, uh, is uh, very important. Um, you won't as have as little latency uh, because latency will affect uh, lots of uh, collisions. Uh, collision detection is very um, difficult if you have uh, a latency that is constantly changing besides your physics loop. Uh, and we use the AI prediction, AI pass to predict when uh, a vehicle should collide with another object. Uh, and Yeah. 
I'll repeat the question first so everybody gets it. So how do we deal with events that are coming in from the server that have some kind of latency? How do we correlate them and sort of adjust them so they apply to the here and now on that client? Because they're always going to be late. And like the quote says at the top, uh, 200 kilometers an hour, that's quite uh, a normal speed for a car. Even a 50 millisecond uh, latency, which is pretty good on the internet, is about three meters. So that would throw off collision detection completely if you do nothing about it. So, mm -hmm. um, so actually uh, what we use for that is prediction. So the event comes in, we look at it, we see it's an old event, it's always going to be a little bit late. And based on that event, we start to predict where the car would be right now. So we fast forward in time, these 50 milliseconds or something, uh, based on the timestamp in the event, and try to predict where will the car be. Simplest is to just extrapolate where it's going and at what speed and just render it there. If you do that, you will see the car drifting around in a big way, especially in turns, because it will always try to fly out of the corner and then magically move like Michael Jackson to the side. Not very realistic. Uh, so the best prediction is to actually let the AI drive the last 50 milliseconds, because they do a reasonable job at also predicting where the human would be going, we hope. It's not always right, but it's our sort of best bet. Also, there are some events that uh, when they come in late, there is a um, priority, like uh, should, I, uh, should the server handle that event or not, or should they just throw it away? So also the server knows how to manage those late events, and should he really process it or not. All right, yeah? Uh, at what um, value does latency mean? You know, what, at what point does it become completely unusable? So uh, empirically, I think uh, most simulators uh, stop uh, complete collision detection control when you have uh, over a second of latency. Uh, that doesn't disconnect the client immediately. I think that happens around two or three seconds. So it can predict reasonably well it will start by not doing or not doing exact collision detection anymore and sort of building up a margin not to mess with the other drivers too much. But one second, that's about a practical limit. I would say in a race, anybody over 200 milliseconds should probably just leave the server because that's going to be a big mess. All right, I will continue with uh, the replays. Uh, when um, the replays are also using the same events as the networking, which uh, uh, it's the same concept, and you can just, uh, when the client receives those events, you can just save them to a file, and after that, you can uh, replay it back in the game. Um, uh, because there's a lot of data uh, going on in the game, uh, you can't really save them all in a file, and it will get too big. So um, in replays, as well as in networking, we throttle those events and use some approximations for some uh, certain data that are, can be guessed uh, accurately. So that will reduce the latency, but also reduce the file size of the replays. Collecting data at 400 hertz tends to give you fairly large files, so we're trying to reduce that a little bit. Okay, uh, without graphics you can't see anything in the race, so you obviously need that. Uh, for a smooth experience, you want to have uh, more than 60 frames per second consistently. Uh, also, you need a large uh, viewing distance because you want to see uh, ahead at speed. Uh, but yeah, having graphics is also tends to have some lot of performance issues, like uh, rendering 40 plus high detailed cars. So yeah, you need them pretty much a big PC to uh, run those things. Um, a thing to um, uh, compensate with uh, performance is uh, pre-render stuff, but uh, not uh, not everything can be pre-rendered, such as weather and track conditions. Uh, that I will go into uh, further when I explain some uh, track conditions in Automobilista. Uh, also, the game is using a, a scene graph to render everything. Just see it as a tree with uh, nodes, and each node has a mesh. It has some textures uh, attached to it, and it has some functions which called sh shaders. 
Um, sound is also very important because you want to know where the opponents are driving by hearing them. So you need some positional sounds to uh, estimate with, in, at which distance your opponents are driving, for example, at your left or right in front of you or behind you. Um, and to make those sounds very realistic, you need to uh, have them record them from real cars. But that tends to be very difficult because um, sounds are most, most of the time combined with physics. And those sounds are specific for those circumstances. So if you record uh, with a microphone and air from an engine, then that should be recorded in such a way that you can reuse it in multiple physics situa situations so that you don't have to record a lot of stuff. Um, of course, uh, you can't hear anything, uh, everything in the game, so there's also a priority in those uh, sound effects. Okay, so with that introduction on how to actually build your own simulator, by now I think everybody should be capable of doing that in this room, uh, let's move on to Automobilista. As Tran already said, it's a game we are collaborating with Reza Studios on building. Uh, we're basically just the programmers, uh, but obviously uh, we have to know uh, a lot about the whole domain. Um, Automobilista is a title that builds on the R-Factor engine, uh, Tran explained. Uh, they licensed the source code. Um, this is quite an old engine. It has been developed, I think, over the last 15, maybe 20 years. So it's, it's a quite uh, an old code base with a, a long history, uh, which uh, means it's uh, very stable, very well tested, but also means it's not even written in Java. It's still C++. So uh, for us, it was sort of a step back again into the history of programming. Uh, going back to C++, learning that, I mean, in the end, it's also an object-oriented language. Uh, Java was probably inspired by it, so uh, it's not that difficult. But there are a couple of things that you need to uh, be aware of uh, that uh, it doesn't do, that Java uh, does for you. Uh, things like uh, memory allocation, garbage collection, and you can make some pretty big mistakes with that, especially if you're still in your Java mindset uh, working, uh, working with the code. Um, it also means you have uh, less tooling available in terms of refactoring support. That's all a little bit less uh, automated and uh, less thought out than in Java. So there's a couple of things that take a little bit more effort. All in all, probably, uh, most of the coding is actually done in your head, designing stuff, architecting it, and not writing out the actual code. So I don't think it makes a real big difference. Uh, but it, yeah, it's a different language, so you need to uh, adapt to that as well. So just uh, looking at, uh, at Automobilista and, and the con some of the content, uh, you see some stuff in the video. There's lots of open wheel cars. Uh, they also have some other types of cars. We'll get into those a little bit later. Uh, we have very spectacular super trucks that are fun to drive, uh, rally cross, and all kinds of uh, sort of more or less normal road cars, even some carts to, to experience. Um, at the moment, the game is on Steam in early access, which means we're still developing it. It'll probably take another month to release the famous 1.0 release where everything's stable and working great. Uh, I think we're, we're, we're getting there. Uh, it's already been tested by a lot of people nowadays, so uh, that's, uh, that's good. We get a lot of feedback from that. Uh, that's also an issue. How do you test a racing game? I mean, we've all learned you need to do unit testing, you need to do integration testing. But this is an area where you really need an experienced human driver trying out all the crazy stuff that humans do. And those are really hard to capture in integration test scripts. So, in fact, we don't have any of those. We rely actually on humans doing all the testing. And at first it sounds really strange, and some people will probably say I'm mad that we're actually doing it like this, 
but in practice it works out pretty well. I wouldn't recommend it for every type of software development, but here it sort of makes sense to do it like that. Right. So, just to explain a little bit about uh, what we've did in probably the last three quarters of a year developing this code base. So we didn't develop it from scratch. We basically got an engine that was already working and we added all kinds of features to it to make it even better and more realistic. And we'll just go over some of these, uh, these features, uh, show them to you and explain a little bit why it helps to have them. Um, so one area that we uh, wanted to improve was uh, the gearbox and how to uh, handle that. Uh, we upgraded it from seven to nine gears, which is not a big change in code, but nowadays there are cars with eight or nine gears, so it makes sense to, to have those. Uh, but more importantly, uh, we wanted to make the, the whole shifting a little bit more realistic. So depending on what car you're in, you actually have to use a clutch or sometimes have to use a clutch or you can always just uh, shift into gear without using a clutch at all. And most of that depends on what kind of mechanics or electronics are in your actual gearbox to help you do those shifts. And especially for some of the older cars that we simulate, we really wanted to make uh, it possible to get that old experience where the car really wouldn't shift if you just slammed it into a gear. You had to actually make sure that the incoming and outgoing revs were sort of similar, otherwise it won't go into gear. So we added stuff where you actually try to shift and you will hear a grinding noise as if metal is exploding next to you uh, and it won't shift and you have to try again. Uh, so that's something we added. We also added some electronics that completely prevent you from shifting. If you're downshifting and you would be damaging your engine because you would over rev it or because you're downshifting way too fast. So stuff like that we added some physics modeling uh, and adding that, uh, that to the code base. Another thing we did is, like I said, this is a, co a code base that has been developed for quite some time. Um, back in the days, uh, 2005, computers were a lot slower than they are now. So we took that opportunity to sort of upgrade some of the calculations, reduce the latency by uh, having a higher frequency uh, in our physics loops, where we went from 360 hertz to 720. Uh, that makes us the fastest running simulation at the moment on the market. Most others are around 400 at the moment. Uh, input reading we've improved uh, a lot. We went from 90 hertz to a maximum of 360. Then discovered that a lot of cheap wheels don't really like it if you read them so quickly. So USB drivers started breaking down. Uh, we had to tune it down a little bit or at least make it optional to, to tune it down. So most will run at 180 hertz nowadays. 360 is the maximum we support. In theory, we could do physics rate at 720, but even the professional wheels don't like 720 hertz at the moment. So we're not offering that as an option for now. And finally, uh, force feedback used to be linked to the frame rate, which uh, is really bad, because especially if there's lots of cars around you that might slow down to below 60 hertz, as Tron says, well, that's not a good uh, thing to happen. But especially if your force feedback starts to work at that frequency, you can almost feel the frames in your steering wheel as well. Uh, and just for, uh, as, as a demonstration, we sometimes uh, slow down uh, the frame rate artificially to like five hertz or something, and then you really feel all the notches in the wheel. Uh, so we changed that. That's also now 360 or 180 hertz, depending on well, what your driver can handle. Uh, and that makes a big improvement. Uh, that's something really you should experience in the simulator later. Uh, so that's what we did to the physics. Then uh, another thing we did is we wanted to introduce super trucks. These are like stadium trucks, a little bit smaller, but with ridiculously large wheels. And you see some of them driving around. And this is some of the coolest stuff. They drive on tracks and on stadiums with lots of ramps. 
So uh, they have cameras all over the place. So you get uh, GoPros from all sides on these trucks, which is really spectacular racing. Uh, and we found out there was an issue with uh, camber. Now, I probably first need to explain what camber is. Camber is actually the angle at which the wheels are standing. And if you look at uh, your car, you might see that they're not completely straight, but they might be tilted inwards or outwards slightly. And also when uh, the suspension is moving, that angle might change a little bit. And in these super trucks, it changes a lot because of the huge jumps and the really soft suspension that they have. And uh, we weren't simulating camber in all uh, places and weren't uh, showing it on replays uh, everywhere, which made, made these jumps look a little bit silly. Uh, so we had to actually improve that, make sure we were sending those events over the network and recording it in replays, uh, just to make this look a little bit, uh, bit better. Another physics thing we uh, sort of discovered is if you drive these cars sort of on their side on two wheels, which is kind of hard to do, but if you're balancing it, you can sort of keep that going for a little while. We also had some spikes in the physics. Uh, probably nobody had ever tried running cars on their side before like that. And there were some edge cases we were running into. We had to uh, look at those and improve those. Uh, to make these trucks uh, uh, handle more realistically, because these are actually driving on three and sometimes two wheels quite regularly in a race, so it's not that uncommon. And it doesn't make sense if the physics break down because of that. So that's uh, that will be fixed there. Okay. Yeah. I actually spent a couple of hours uh, getting that going because another guy was reporting that this, he was doing the physics and he said, I can drive on two wheels and then it breaks down. So I had to sort of replicate that first because I didn't believe him, obviously. But then, yeah, I, I noticed the same problem and I actually couldn't sustain the drive because there was some strange force acting on the wheel. Uh, so maybe it was just too difficult for us and we needed to make it easier. I don't know. <laughs> the data looked strange, so I think there was an issue there. But yeah. Uh, another thing that we did for uh, these trucks and also some other cars is introduce helper springs. And helper springs are actually springs that are put on top of your normal spring uh, and that are usually a lot softer than the normal spring. Uh, because especially with uh, a lot of racing cars, you often need to compromise between having a really uh, stiff uh, spring because you need to handle high loads in corners and you don't want your car to be completely sideways uh, versus on the other side having a very soft spring because soft spring means that your uh, transitions when you're steering into the corner are more smooth and more smooth means less high forces, and that means you have better grip. So you're always trying to make your springs as soft as you can, while still compromising and making sure that you're not uh, uh, turning over the car too much and unbalancing it in corners. Uh, so a standard trick is to actually use two springs, a really soft one, so the initial response becomes a little bit softer, and then a really hard one as sort of a second spring uh, to make sure that you uh, don't have too much travel in your springs. And the simulation didn't have those two springs. We added one. Well, that's just going back to uh, very basic physics about springs. Uh, those are not too hard to calculate. So, so we added a bit of uh, uh, logic there to, to deal with that. And uh, finally, uh, well, we had some electronic aids in, in, the, in the existing game, and those were mainly there to make it a little bit easier for people to drive. So if you drive for the first time, you could get some anti-lock brakes and traction control and stuff like that, just to make it a little bit easier to drive. Uh, but nowadays, a lot of these systems are also available uh, on real cars. Not Well, they are driving aids there as well, but not to help you uh, play the game better, but just to make the car drivable. And in some cases, you can't even turn those off anymore. They're just there, part of the car. One car has them, the other car doesn't. 
and uh, the game really didn't support any of that. So we basically took the existing aids and also made them configurable as part of the actual car. So if you're driving a Mini in this game, for example, it always has traction control. You can't even turn it off. So if you're driving that, even if the rest is not allowed to have traction control, since your car has it, you can still use it. So that was a bit of reconfiguring the code, uh, but the, the features were basically already there. So we just made them configurable in a, in a different way. Okay. All right, then I'll, we'll continue with uh, steer rotation. Uh, all the cars have uh, different steer, uh, steer rotations and you want to experience that steer rotation on your actual wheel. Um, so we um, made it possible that uh, the game can set the steer rotation of the mm, car that you are driving onto your wheel, steering wheel. Um, but not every mm, steer, mm, steering wheel supports setting the rotation of it. Um, yeah, we have to figure out something to uh, simulate that um, steer rotation on your actual steering wheel. Uh, which we uh, used the uh, steer ratio with the steering wheel lock, which means the, if um, a steering wheel is rotating 900 degrees and the um, wheel is locking at 22 degrees, but your uh, actual steering wheel is um, only supporting 450 degrees, which means that if you uh, rotate your 450 degrees uh, steer wheel, that your wheel will rotate twice as quickly to simulate uh, the actual steering. Uh, as you can see in the clip, uh, we, uh, the cars have some different steer rotations. You have a uh, Formula One car which almost rotates 900 degrees just to show the effect. And the cart, it's only 90 degrees to the left uh, in total of 180 degrees. Uh, to support this uh, feature of applying the steer rotation on your hardware, we need to have uh, multiple vendor support. And there isn't a st standard API to um, set those uh, steer rotations on your hardware. So we have a lot of vendor specific code in the code base. All right. Then, mm, it's not very. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, not a variable, but if you're going to the pit stop uh, in your garage, you can configure uh, the rotation uh, of the steer in the car, like tuning it, and that automatically applies to your wheel. But no such thing as uh, like a variable on the speed, like below 70 or... Yeah, that, that is actually uh, varying with speed. So if you're uh, normally on the racetrack, you don't need to steer that much because the corners are not that sharp. But when driving into your pits and actually making it into your garage, you need to steer a little bit sharper. And we can have some speed dependent multiplier so you can steer sharper at low speed. And that's mainly used for pit stops and in some cases for steering wheels that don't support a lot of rotation because then at speed you want to have a lower ratio and to still make the garage you make it higher when you're driving at, at low speed yeah all right then i'll continue with uh, tires tires are very important in the game and you want to simulate them as real as possible and for that you want to simulate some behaviors of uh, the tires when racing uh, one of the things that uh, we want to simulate is uh, a flat spot which is when you're uh, braking very hard and you lock your wheel, um, the wheel will scrape across the road, which uh, and results in a, a spot on the tire that it's flat and that will uh, cause your vehicle to uh, shake a little bit more. And when the tire wears off, and then that spot will disappear again because it rounds it, the tires back again. Uh, I'll have a clip. Hopefully the frame rate isn't good enough. But uh, I'm uh, just uh, driving a uh, ground braking hard and yeah, as you can see, the tires are locking. And if I mm, throttle a little bit more, the, the car continues to shake a little bit more and it will continue to shake more and more when you get up to speed. And you also can see, oh, well, I'll just wait. 
it's also visualized on the tires. So if you have a flat spot, uh, you see a darker mark or a lighter mark on your wheels. Maybe it's not that clear, but you, you should see it a little bit. Mwah. All right. Um, but we also want to, um, yeah, the game didn't support any uh, dirt or grass pickup uh, when you... Oh, well, you're not supposed to drive on the green stuff, so uh, mm -hmm. they didn't actually simulate that. Uh. Let's see if it's still working. Oh, yeah. Oh. Yes. So, yeah, you don't uh, supposed to uh, uh, go off track. But uh, when you go off track, uh, the car will build up some uh, dirt and grass. As you can see, uh, I'm driving uh, way off track. But uh, it, it results into uh, the tires picking up some stuff. And you, as you can see, the tire is not black anymore. And it contains a lot of uh, grass and dirt. And this is visualized. But it also has an effect on the grip. So you get less grip uh, when you go on the track and you drive a little bit more, the tires will clean up. So, and also that will be visualized. Also, these, uh, these things, the flat spot and um, grass and dirt pickup, will also send an event so that uh, once you replay it, it will be shown in the replay. Same as a uh, networking, uh, same event. All right. Then we also have uh, tire compounds. Um, the game uh, originally has some uh, DLL injections to change your tire compounds and visualize it. Uh, but uh, yes, yeah, some dirty DLL injection, and now we have the source code. We can um, and do it in the game itself. So how does uh, that work? Uh, each tire has some animations and uh, different stages of uh, speed uh, to prevent some uh, wagon wheel effects, and that is uh, the ones that you know, when you see a wheel rotating on the television, the wheel seems to go backwards. So this is what we want to f prevent, and to do that, we just set some animation keys. So every time you go, for example, uh, 100 kilometers per hour, the, the letters and the um, color is fading, and when you go further and further, it's getting more blurry and blurry. Um, and you want to uh, show also which tire compounds you are driving with. So we added some um, functionality to show that in those animations. Uh, and as you can see, you can the animations will cycle through every compound with every speed blur texture. All right. Uh, the graphics like flat spot and uh, dirt built up are um, basically hidden textures on the uh, wheels and the tires. And when the game computes which value uh, the dirt and opacity of the grass should have been, uh, it will send it to the shader and the shader you know, changes the texture visibility of the grass and dirt. So the shader is basically a function that apply, can be applied on a texture or a mesh. Also, the game has some uh, user interface, and uh, it's not uh, very clear, but uh, all the, uh, all the uh, UI stuff is defined in one single file for the game, um, and it's a reference to uh, UI components. And UI components are defined in the code, and in the UI file, you just references to those uh, UI components. As you can see in the uh, screenshot, you have this piece of uh, small code, which result in a, a slide uh, and toggle of uh, AI aggression. Uh, not only we have a, um, a UI in the game, but you also have a head-up display for uh, while driving the car, um, and those are uh, done in a plugin that called Denhut. It's open sourced, uh, and it uses the game plugin API to get all the uh, data such as speed and uh, what uh, your tires are wearing out and so such, which uh, you can then uh, use uh, in an editor to create some user widgets. So um, there's a lot of uh, ways in communities that create their own widgets for the broadcasting so that you can see what the leaderboards are, but also um, information while driving such as speedometer and time lapse and etc. Uh, to do that, we uh, the Dinhut uh, is using some um, uh, Java code. It it starts uh, when the game starts. It starts itself as a Java process, 
which um, uh, renders uh, just a 2D canvas, uh, loads up the UI widgets, and injects it back into the, the uh, 3D DLL, which pop-ups as a, a layer above the game. Right, we have also have a uh, new game mode that is time trial, which is basically uh, uh, drive the fast possible uh, lap time, uh, and there's some preconditions like uh, like having a rolling uh, rolling start, and no tire wear and fuel consumption. As you can see on the left uh, bottom corner, there's some uh, widgets, and that's something you can do in and then not. It's uh, user created. So what you uh, just heard was uh, uh, the sound effects for uh, Formula uh, One car, uh, and we just added some um, more effects to it. And yeah, as you can hear, it sounds very realistic and has some positional um, sound uh, positions. I hope it can be heard in this uh, in this room. But uh, we added some more events to it, and I, I did. I wanted to show it without any screens, so that, that's why the screen was black. Right. So moving on, uh, another thing we did was uh, to actually integrate this game more with Steam because we were actually going to publish it on Steam. Uh, Steam normally does software distribution. It does some DRM for you. That's all nice to have. But we added a couple of extra things as well, such as a matchmaker where you could publish all the different servers that are running and easily pick a server that was uh, racing the track and the cars that you want and, and join that. Uh, and we also included some features that would allow you to see where your friends are racing and quickly jump into the same server as they are. Uh, just some more social features to make it easier to get a game started and meet up with your friends that way. So uh, that's in short what we did with Steam. Uh, it's very interesting to see their APIs because normally you can't see them, they are under NDA. Uh, so it's nice to, to view how they did that uh, and how they make that scale to like the 8 million users concurrently that they have online. So that was pretty, pretty interesting. Okay, then I have a clip to show you. Uh, this uh, is a situation uh, we are driving in a fork, which uh, looks pretty awesome. But uh, there's also something that's called uh, driver labels. The uh, game already has some driver labels, but they were uh, ugly, and we just uh, improved them so that they're more visible and much clearer. So yeah, you see the fork is uh, also pretty cool. Um, yeah, that's about fork. Uh, fork, uh, you want to also be based on time of the day, which uh, the game didn't support some smooth transitions between those days. And I've got a clip that shows a uh, time lapse about how the fork uh, goes in the game. Uh, another thing that you can see is that the flags uh, are still waving at the same uh, animation speed as the actual game. And you can see the birds flying at the rather very high speed. Uh, but yeah, we want to have the flag animations uh, rap, um, animations at the same speed as the, the game because uh, when you uh, fast forward time, they, they were animated very sporadically and uh, didn't sound Look, very yeah. good. Looked weird. Yeah, yeah, looked weird. Right. Then we also have some uh, dynamic track conditions. Yeah, most of the modern racing games have uh, dynamic track conditions. And what are dynamic track conditions? When uh, your tires are wearing in the corners, um, yeah, there's some little bit pieces of rubber uh, flying off those tires and will go will go on the track. Uh, on the racing lines that uh, improves the um, grip, but uh, besides those racing lines, the racing lines that uh, will decrease your effects and the, those rubber pellets called uh, marbles. As you can see in the clip, 
the racing lines will get darker uh, with the time being. Um, yeah, that's about it for dynamic tracks. Uh, also, those uh, values of those uh, conditions are sent over the cross network. We uh, keep them as small as possible for uh, latency reasons. But yeah, that's about dynamic tracks. Okay, that's uh, sort of a short summary of all the things we did. We left a few things out, uh, but uh, lots of little and s somewhat bigger things that we tweaked. Um, over the time that we uh, were involved in this project, I think there's a couple of uh, lessons we learned. Uh, first of all, and I hope you've learned a little bit about that uh, too in this past hour, we've learned a lot about uh, sim racing, about the domain of simulation, how to make that realistic, uh, and how cars actually uh, work, and how they perform at speed. Uh, so that was interesting. Uh, I mentioned before a little bit about how uh, we actually do testing. Uh, we actually have a, a small group of alpha testers uh, that test each build as we create it, and then we have a larger group of beta testers, mainly because there's so many different combinations of computers and hardware and stuff that it's just ridiculous to try and replicate everything yourself. You have to build an extra house to make all that stuff fit. Uh, so it's a lot uh, more efficient to have a sm smaller group and a slightly larger group actually testing those features and reporting feedback. And if you have the, the right amount of uh, logging and uh, other statistics in your game, you can probably figure out what's going on on their uh, systems based on that. So that's been very uh, helpful. Uh, we've also been learning a lot about uh, C++, uh, relearning it. Uh, some of the things we're uh, using a lot are asserts to just make sure that at each point in the simulation that values are within the limits that we expect them to be, because uh, we know if they go outside those limits, everything will become unstable anyway. So we really, especially in development versions, want to make sure that we stop the world if something goes wrong and that we can actually diagnose what's going on. Uh, standard asserts in C++ are not that great. If you have a 400 hertz simulation loop and you have a assert inside that loop, it tends to get pretty boring quickly if you have a dialogue popping up 400 times a second and you try to click it away. So we added some stuff like ignore all of these in the future because I'm testing something else. I just want to get past this point for now. And we also wanted to really be able to jump into a debugger and really look at the code at, at the exact moment of time that an assert actually occurred. So that's that stuff we did. Um, yeah, like I said before, C++ development is not that different from Java. It tends to take a little bit more time which is also why we did the whole head-up display in Java, because it was new anyway, so we integrated that, and it's not that time critical. Uh, well, it, ha it is a little bit, but it's not that uh, big of a problem if it lags like five or 10 milliseconds. I mean, people can't read numbers that quickly anyway, so that, that's pretty fine. Um, and that did help us uh, uh, develop those things at a slightly higher uh, speed. Uh, and yeah, probably in the future we will move more of the non-time critical uh, systems to Java or other languages that are slightly quicker to, uh, to develop, but leave all the existing core and the real-time stuff there in, in C++. Yeah. Cool. Mm -hmm. And looking ahead a little bit, uh, and this is just some of the features that we've been, uh, been uh, announcing after the 1.0 release, so at least uh, a month away, probably a little bit more. We're going to be working on a whole web portal with a multiplayer lobby uh, to get people into the game uh, and get them involved through their browser, because it's a lot easier to just browse some website and see what's going on, join your race directly from there. So we'll have more features for that, leaderboards uh, based on the time trial and stuff, stuff like that. Technically, we're going to do uh, driver animations. You really haven't seen any arms or steering wheels in the game, but right now they're just 3D objects that rotate with the wheel, which looks kind of bad. 
So uh, we're adding an animation library so we can properly have people turning steering wheels and all the way back and stuff. Um, we're also going to be doing a couple of new uh, physics things uh, like better turbo modeling. We're going to do air density uh, simulation so we can actually drive up a hill and the air gets less and less dense influencing the actual performance of the engine and uh, the downforce that you get. And for hill climbs, that's really cool if you can show that, uh, that difference. And we're going to do a few uh, extra tracks and some new cars as well. Uh, if you're interested, uh, look at the website. You can see more of that. Um, yeah, beyond 1.0 and beyond the features we just mentioned for the next product, we're looking at uh, building a new graphic, uh, graphics engine. Uh, one important thing is to start supporting VR headsets. I mean, they're really new now, and if you look at market share, you're probably crazy if you start uh, spending a lot of money on developing for them right now. But in a couple of years, maybe everybody's walking around with one. I don't know. Could be. Uh, and it would be pretty nice if you could support that in a racing simulator as well. Because it takes less space than three projectors or screens and stuff. So I think a lot of people will at least start try, uh, trying them out. Uh, and also uh, by using a existing graphics engine, we can probably save a lot of development time. Because right now it's a custom built engine. 15 years ago you had to do that because there was no standard engines you could use. Right now it might not be the smartest thing to do. So. It's one of the things we're looking into, but it's a big change, or so not something we're going to make in the next couple of months, probably. And with that, I'm not sure if we have time for any questions, maybe one or two, and then you can all have lunch. So if you have any questions, let me know. Um, we've been working on it for, I think, about nine months. Yeah, yeah. started last summer. Uh, well, that's always interesting with game development because that largely depends on how well the game does. No income, no next version. It's that simple. So we hope so. And it's looking good at the moment. So I think we'll be doing some more work uh, soon. Yeah. Sorry? No, this is, uh, this is not something we do in our spare time. This is actually something we're doing at Luminous. Yeah. Uh, It's, ah, yeah, aerodynamics, I mean, obviously it's very important, just looking at the amount of time that teams spend in wind tunnels, so uh, next to tires, it's probably the most important thing in a car. Uh, simulating aerodynamics is quite difficult, and there's not a lot of teams that can do that in real time, so it's going to be a little bit simpler than uh, reality. So what we have in terms of aerodynamics are uh, usually the drag of different components and the downforce or upforce of some of them. So we apply those at different points in the chassis to simulate the different wings and other effects that we have uh, so we can probably simulate uh, stuff like that. It's, it's a, probably a crude approximation of, of, of the real uh, physics going on there. but. Uh, good enough to get us close to 1% of real uh, data if we have properly modeled our car. Yeah. You have, um, you've been thinking about going, or you might go, uh, using a game engine. Is there a big, um, do you actually have a physics engine and a game engine at the moment, or are there really tied together? That's, that's a good question, and that's the actual uh, problem. Right now, they are quite closely tied together, physics and graphics. And I guess they'll always be, because you have areas like collision detection, where one really relies on the other uh, to make it work. Yeah, yes. and they are completely unusable for car simulations. So the, the physics engine that is actually contained in... Uh, the graphics cards nowadays, hardware accelerated, very nice if you need to knock over boxes or walls, unusable for car physics. So we cannot use that other than maybe 
have roadside objects that you can drive through, but that's all nice to have and not really what racing is about. Yeah. Yeah. The, the two of us, we only know programming. We are very bad at throwing, doing 3D modeling, uh, sound. Uh, there's other specialists in the team that only do that stuff. Uh, in fact, the, there's already a difference between people modeling cars and modeling tracks, because those are also two completely different disciplines. Uh, so we have a lot of specialists for each of these areas. Yeah. yeah. Okay, since that was the last question, thanks all for attending and enjoy your lunch.